Good. First of all, welcome to the Hoover Institution's Washington, D.C. office. My name is Mike Frank. I'm the director. Uh, really excited about tonight's event. Uh, we're featuring an author of a new book, Free Speech, Ten Principles for a Connected World, which if you haven't grabbed a copy, please, please do so. Uh, and it's also the inaugural visit to our Washington office, still relatively new office, uh, by Timothy Garden Ash, who we're honored to have here, senior fellow at Hoover and professor of European Studies uh, at Oxford University. Um, he's the author of 10 books charting the transformation of Europe over the last 30 years. Uh, he's been published in many venues and is a good read no matter where you find him. Uh, in the 1980s, traveled and studied extensively behind the Iron Curtain, reported and analyzed the emancipation of Central Europe from communism after the wall came down. Um, he's received many awards. He's, he was appointed as a companion to the British Order of St. Michael and St. George, which honors individuals who have rendered important services in relation to Commonwealth of Foreign Affairs. That sounds like a uniquely British distinction. Very honored to have you here for that. In 2005, uh, Timothy Garden Ash was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the world's 100 most influential people. And in, a year later, he won the George Orwell Prize for political writing. Uh, and Timothy Garton Ash will be the first speaker. We'll spend about 20 minutes talking about his book. And then we're going to turn to our other two speakers. And let me introduce them briefly as well. Uh, Tom Malinowski has been the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor uh, since 2014. And previously, he'd been the Washington Director of the Human Rights Watch, one of the world's leading independent international organizations uh, dedicated to defending and protecting human rights. And from 1998 to 2001, uh, Mr. Malinowski served as Senior Director of the National Security Council. And kind of a special interest, he was a Rhodes Scholar uh, at Oxford, and he studied under no one, a few at less than Timothy Garden Ash. Mark Lagan is the uh, last speaker who will comment, President of Freedom House since 2014. Uh, Freedom House is probably best known for its annual uh, Freedom in the World Report, which rates countries according to the level of uh, political and democratic freedoms. And uh, prior to that, Mark had been the chair of global politics and security at Georgetown University, uh, Masters of Foreign Service Program. And he was ambassador at large, directing the office uh, to monitor and combat trafficking in person from 2007 to 2009 the State Department. Uh, Mark has his PhD in government from Georgetown. And he's written numerous articles on democracy, human trafficking, and human rights. So, Timothy, you want to start us off? Well, thank you very much, Mike. And it's a huge pleasure to be here and spend an hour not talking about Brexit. <laughs> um, this book couldn't have been written without the Hoover Institution, so this is a small thank you to that great institution. And it's a huge pleasure to be here on the platform with Tom and Mark. Eons ago in Oxford, I actually supervised Tom's master's thesis on the Polish Solidarity Movement, uh, whose strike action he proceeded to put into action uh, uh, at St. Anthony's College uh, the next week. Um, but it's wonderful to see him now practicing what we merely preach. And of course, I've learned a great deal over the years from the work of Freedom House. Let me start by telling you a story about free speech in a connected world. In July 2011, a young woman called Lily Dion, uh, who'd come to Hollywood to make her name in the movies, answered an advertisement on Craigslist for a movie shoot. The movie was to be called Desert Warrior. It turned out to be a rather strange movie shoot. It was set in the Middle East some 2,000 years ago, but the chief character was someone known as George. And they kept talking about George. Another actor who had unfortunately to murder a pregnant woman and then raise his bloody sword and cry, George is the messenger and the book is our constitution. Later, they were summoned back to record individual words such as Mohammed. A year later, someone calling himself Sam Basile posted on YouTube a 13-minute B-movie, P-13 
piece of rubbish called The Real Life of Mohammed, in which the alleged Mohammed did a lot of very nasty things to various people. This movie, if we can call it a movie, was described by none other than Salman Rushdie with one well-chosen word, crap. It was, along with millions of hours of other pieces of rubbish, which nobody takes any notice of, according to Cisco, it would take six million years to watch the videos that go across global networks every month. Nobody took any notice for months until, in September 2012, a Coptic Christian extremist blogger picked it up, wrote an indignant blog. This was picked up by a Cairo uh, newspaper, in turn picked up by a Salafist, Egyptian Salafist preacher who had a very popular satellite TV show and gave a rant about it on the 9th of September 2012. And then, of course, as we all know, all hell breaks loose. Two days later, not accidentally, 9-11-2012, the Egyptian Salafists organize a huge demonstration calculated mainly to show that they're much better Muslims than the Muslim Brotherhood who are then in power. And in Benghazi, as you all know, the US consulate was stormed and Ambassador Christopher Stevens brutally killed. As you know, this is the subject of highly political congressional hearings, but the New York Times, which did an extensive investigation, found that many uh, bystanders recalled the attackers giving them lectures on what had become known as the Innocence of Muslims movie. Within a month, more than 50 people had died in demonstrations in places like Pakistan and Afghanistan in protest against this movie many of them had never seen. US and Israeli flags were burned, although the US and Israeli governments had absolutely nothing to do with the um, video. General Martin Dempsey, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, personally telephoned an obscure backwards Florida pastor called Terry Jones, the guy who'd burnt the Quran, to plead with him not to promote this video. Think of it. The, command, the, 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 the chief of the mightiest armed forces the world has ever seen feels he has to personally telephone this backwards Florida pastor. The White House reached out to Google to ask them to review the video and see if it was in line with their community standards. Google said yes it was, they'd already reviewed it, but Google then received tens of requests from countries around the world. Some they complied with, some they didn't, but they unilaterally took the video down in Egypt and Libya. At the UN General Assembly that September, numerous heads of states talked about the issue at length. The Pakistani president said, I quote, the international community should criminalize such acts that destroy the peace of the world and endanger world security by misusing freedom of expression. What exactly he meant was spelled out, I think, by one member of his cabinet of the Pakistani government who personally offered a $100,000 reward for, quote, whoever kills the makers of the video. Sam Basile had in the meantime been revealed as a California-based Egyptian copt out on parole after doing time for bank and credit card fraud in California. Now had a hundred thousand dollar reward on his head. Interestingly, this member of the Pakistani government, interviewed by the BBC, said, I think if America and the Western world had some laws that our profit, peace be upon him, is not disgraced, I would not have done this. So he was saying all you need to do, America and Europe, is just introduce a Pakistani-style blasphemy law. And if you prevent blasphemy against the Prophet Muhammad in Europe and America, everything will be fine. Now, amusingly, this guy, his name was uh, Ghulam Ahmed Bilal, was actually a moderate in Pakistani politics, so moderate that the Taliban had a death threat on him with a reward. But in light of his brave and vigorous response, 
to the Innocents of Muslims video, they lifted the death threat. So all it takes to lift a death threat from the Taliban is to make a death threat against someone else. All this, ladies and gentlemen, this global turmoil had been unleashed by one sleazy little video being posted on YouTube by a convicted fraudster in Southern California. Welcome to the connected world of my subtitle. This is a world in which we are tendentially all becoming neighbors as a result of mass migration and the internet, either physically or virtually. We are all becoming neighbors. Um, it is a world in which most of the great free speech incidents of our time have the dual character of this Innocence of Muslims episode. They are at once local and global, at once physical and virtual. And another characteristic is that they often rapidly escalate towards violence, often in other places, Pakistan, Afghanistan, almost never as a result of spontaneous responses. There is always some local politics which ensures that that one of the thousands of pieces of crap uploaded to YouTube every day will be the one that provokes a protest. So, the Salafists against the Muslim Brotherhood. Another absolutely characteristic feature is that the key player is often not the state, not governments. It's what I call the private superpowers, the Googles, the Facebook with its 1.6 billion monthly users, the Twitters, the Wikipedias. This is not to say that the state has become irrelevant. That has turned out to be a cyber-utopian illusion. Some of you will remember Bill Clinton saying in the year 2000, for the Chinese Communist Party to try to control the internet would be like trying to nail jello to the wall. And the Chinese Communist Party turned around and said, OK, just watch us. And I would have to tell you that if you look at what the Chinese Communist Party has done in the last 16 years with the largest apparatus of censorship in human history, they've made a pretty good stab at nailing Jello to the Great Firewall of China. I don't believe they will win in the very long term. It takes a huge, a massive effort to control it, but in the short to medium term, they're making a pretty good stab of nailing Jello to the wall. But your effective freedom of expression, wherever you are, is no longer just a product of the state you're in. Here, the First Amendment, their English law, their Indian law. It's a product of the private superpowers, Facebook, Google, Twitter, their Wikipedia, their reach. It's a product of the international organizations and institutions which have sway where you are. Example the European Court of Justice ruling on the, quote, right to be forgotten. That Google pays a lot of attention to because of the massive regulatory power of the EU with its huge market. European Court of Human Rights judgments, Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And last but not least, networked individuals, including NGOs, can in certain circumstances have a significant impact on your effective freedom of expression. So my argument is that our effective freedom of expression in this connected world is a result of the interaction of these four forces. So what we did in this project, and this originates in a, in a project I've been leading at Oxford University for many years, which has this multilingual website, freespeechdebate.com, is through a process of research and debate develop a position which we articulate in terms of 10 extremely simple, stripped down to essentials, muscular principles for global freedom of expression. And there are 10 principles, like that man Moses, um, and then under each principle, and of course the principle is only the starting point, on privacy, on religion, on national security, on living with diversity, on violence, and we can talk about them in the discussion period. Each chapter in the book and each section of the website 
has an in-depth discussion of how this applies in different parts of the world, looking at many different and difficult cases, like, for example, the innocence of Muslims. And incidentally, I don't just ask the classic question of the discussion of free speech in the First Amendment tradition, which is how free should speech be. I also ask the equally important question, how should free speech be, right? So in the characteristic of a free country is we do as little as possible by external restraint, by coercion, but as much as possible by voluntary self-restraint. So the argument here is do as little as possible to limit free speech by law, but as much as possible by choice in civil society through what I call, and this is a key phrase of the whole book, robust civility. Robust civility. So, for example, we've just written a new free speech policy for Oxford University, because as you know, there's been a lot of discussion around free speech in universities, which we can talk about. Um, and this is a very robust statement, which indeed, partly because I partly wrote it, uses this phrase, robust civility, to, 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 to describe what we're trying to achieve voluntarily by self-restraint, but not by coercion. So, that, in briefest summary, is what the book's about, it's what the website is about. The website is in 13 languages, Hindi, Farsi, Urdu, Russian, Chinese, Arabic. Uh, I have a fantastic team of graduate students at Oxford, who work on this, native speakers of these 13 languages. And we're now entering, it's designed, by the way, to work even better on smartphone than on laptop, because, of course, we're now entering a smartphone world. More than 2 billion smartphones, due to be close to 4 billion by 2020. Um, that's how we're promoting free speech in a connected world. But we have in England a saying, taking coals to Newcastle. And to t preach free speech in the United States is like taking coals to Newcastle. Because if there's one country in the world where you don't have to talk about free speech, it's the United States. You have the greatest tradition of institutionalized free speech, and I would say socially internalized understanding of free speech in the world. It's clearly one of the ideas defining a free society, to take one of Hoover's great mottos, which is out there in the hall. The question rather, and I hope it's a question for our conversation, is what can the West in general, and the United States in particular, do, or perhaps do more, or do differently, to promote free speech in a connected world where we face a very strong counter-tide of illiberalism, or I would argue slightly distinctly, anti-liberalism. They're two slightly different things. Uh, and Freedom House has, of course, chronicled how, particularly over the last five to ten years, and we've seen it in this project in country after country, Turkey, Egypt, Russia, China, things have been moving in the wrong direction. In a sense, we're fighting a defensive action. And, of course, in the same period, the relative power of the West at least economically, uh, has diminished. I stress re relative power. So what's to be done? Let me throw out a few questions and then hand over to Tom and Mark to open up the discussion. Point number one. I spent a lot of my life first fighting the Cold War and then studying the Cold War. And I have absolutely no doubt that by far the most important thing that the West did in the course of the Cold War was to keep our own societies open, free, strong, prosperous, attractive. Far the most important thing we did. The same is true of free speech. Now you may say, ah, oh, but in a connected world, the barrier between domestic policy and foreign policy has entirely broken down. Right. For precisely that reason, what you do at home is even more important, because everybody else can see it much more than they used to be able to. They can see it once. And if you're preaching one thing abroad and doing something different at home, the world will immediately see it and pick up on it. So in my book, one of the most important things the United States has done for promoting free speech 
in the wider world over the last 10 years is the net neutrality ruling of the FCC, for which of course the Obama administration strongly argued. Leading by example, Tim Berners-Lee's World Wide Web Foundation did a study of a number of countries, quite a large number of countries, and they found that only in three quarters of those countries you could not talk about net neutrality. Net neutrality is no longer the global norm, it's rather an exception. All the more important that the United States is practicing what it preaches. <coughs> Secondly, the very difficult balance between freedom and security. Now, that's a genuinely difficult balance, but what is clear is that every time we, or the United States, to some extent reduces or infringes free speech in the name of security, authoritarians everywhere say, hey, we're only doing what they're doing. We're just doing slightly different. So, I'll give an example. When San Francisco shut down um, wireless networks at a number of subway stations to prevent a demonstration, and David Cameron talked of doing the same thing, China's news agency Xinhua said, I quote, we may wonder why Western leaders on the one hand tend to unanimously accuse other nations of monitoring, but on the other, take for granted their steps to monitor and control the internet. To Kwokwe. The example of circumvention technology, TOR. Supported, its development supported by US government funding, then used by WikiLeaks to release the great horde of US diplomatic cables. So the right hand of US government is trying to control what the left hand of US government has supported. It's a genuine tension. Encryption on the iPhone will be another example. This leads to a further point which is really important in the global conversation about free speech. Sovereignty versus internationalism. Sovereignty versus the remarkable claim of Article 19 that we should be free to seek, receive, and, and impart information and ideas, I quote, regardless of frontiers, regardless of frontiers. Now, of course, the United States was to have them both. It's a great advocate of Article 19, of an international human rights agenda, but it's also a terrific defender of its own sovereignty, almost like a classic 19th century European nation state. Quick example, this is rather obscure, I, I, forgive me, but it's interesting. The legal, international legal form of Article 19 is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The first optional protocol to the ICCPR says, if you've exhausted domestic remedies, you can appeal to the Human Rights Committee of the UN. Now that may not do you much good, but at least it's there out there. The United States has strongly urged other countries to sign the first optional protocol, but of course has not done so itself. Same with the law of the sea and so on. There is a tension there, and there is a tension particularly in what I call the struggle for word power, where in particular China and Russia are proposing a quite different model which the Chinese explicitly call information sovereignty, which restores the control of the Westphalian territorial state over everything to do with information, including the internet. Now, particularly in the wake of the Snowden revelations, I'm sorry to say that model of information sovereignty has really been gaining a lot of ground around the world not just in authoritarian states, also in what I call the swing states for free speech, countries like Brazil and India, which with their post-colonial attitude, which places a high premium on sovereignty, are quite tempted by the appeal of the idea of information sovereignty, particularly in the case of Brazil, when President Xi Jinping comes visiting with a heap of money for their media and internet superstructure. The same tension, of course, in internet governance. The United States 
quite rightly, in my view, trying to defend the multi-stakeholder model of ICANN against what is a theoretically more consistent model of having it in the International Telecommunication Union, member states, equal power. In theory, a stronger view. Another question. I move rapidly on. A lot of us who hugely admired the work of Radio Free Europe in the Cold War, which is a fantastic success story, had amazing attraction power, have asked ourselves why it seems, Tom may correct me, but it seems the United States hasn't been able to do anything quite as spectacular since. What is it? Partly a question of resources, maybe. If you look at China, the resources, if you look at Africa, I beg, beg your pardon, the resources that China is pouring into African communications and media are quite spectacular. And they're winning. There is no question. They are winning the, the game in Africa. Skill. Russia Today TV. I don't know how many of you watch RT. Well, I have that pressure. I see a few smiles around the room. It's extremely skillful. Extremely skillful, particularly in English language. One of my favorites is the way they describe TTIP. They consistently call it the TIP. <laughs> it's not a great acronym, but they call it the TIP. The lives of farmen in Michigan, how terrible are the lives of farmen in Michigan, explored at great length. It's very skillfully done. RT Online. Many people who use RT Online in English, Spanish, and German don't know it's Russia today. So we're up against a well resourced, very skillfully deployed uh, operations. Um, or is it that actually, these days, it's not the equivalent of RFE, it's not a publicly funded operation. Maybe it should be, actually it's Google and Twitter and Facebook. Maybe it's the independent, the private superpowers. But the problem we have <coughs> is that these themselves, over the last 15 years, have become quite unpopular in many parts of the world, not least in Europe. I spoke at a speaker's corner at the Brandenburg Gate, which was supported by Google, and I spoke passionately in favor of free speech. The first question from the crowd was, but isn't the greatest threat to free speech actually Google? Uh, the people from Google were not best pleased. Um, the French talk uh, uh, darkly of les GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, les GAFA. Now, there's, I think, an interesting question here, whether it has been altogether beneficial that the American private superpowers on the West Coast and the public superpower with its headquarters on the East Coast in this town have got or have been seen to get so relatively close together, right? When I started using Google about 15 years ago, I remember I didn't think of it as something really American at all. I thought of it as something sort of wonderfully supranational and quite neutral. In the meantime, it's come to be very closely identified with the United States. And to be honest, there is quite a revolving door of people who go in and out of government and then back to the private superpowers and then back into government. I put the question on the table, good thing or bad thing. I'm not sure it is necessarily. I think these something like Google and Facebook had the chance to be some, seen as something really in, tra supranational, transcultural, and now they're seen as very much American. My very final point, I'm sorry I've gone on a bit long, but again, this for discussion, is actually, I think, in a way, the most profound one of all. It's a cultural and philosophical point. So, in absolute simplistic caricature, the United States represents a position which I call unilateral universalism. And China represents a position which I call universal unilateralism. So the United States essentially says there are certain truths which we find to be self-evident. And by and large, we in the West have discovered most of them. And we hope you'll sign up to them. And then it'll be a whole lot better for you. I, I parody but slightly, as you will see. China, universal unilateralism, says, you do it your way, we do it ours. That's a theory. Of course, the practice of Chinese policy is very different. 
but the theory is almost Huntingtonian. Now, that unilateral universalism was for decades enormously effective while the United States had such extraordinary soft power. While people thought that because these are Western ideas, particularly American ideas, almost by definition they must be good ideas. And this is a tradition of thinking that goes back at least a hundred years. The first Chinese tr translation of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty was done by a man called Yan Fu, and the way he thought about it was this. Britain is rich and powerful. Britain has liberalism. Right? We want China to be rich and powerful, so we better have liberalism. He didn't actually understand liberalism at all. All the way through to the 1980s, the Tiananmen generation in China, it was something very similar, very pro-American, very pro-Western. These ideas are great, they're Western ideas. No longer. No longer the case in China, no longer the case in many parts of the world. And the most sort of fundamental argument of my book is that I think that we in the West have to try to move gradually towards what I call a more universal universalism. One which is true to the original ideas of the Enlightenment, which were genuinely universal ideas, not just European or Western universalist. And that means engaging much more deeply than we've done in the past with other cultures, other philosophical traditions, trying to find all the points of agreement, which is something I've done in this book on free speech in, say, Indian philosophical tradition or Chinese philosophical tradition, and you can certainly find them, and then getting into a conversation, but conducting the conversation in a more open way, not in the spirit of, hey guys, we've got all the answers, just go to Ikea and you buy the kit, but in the spirit of, we think this is the best way to do things. We're convinced of that. We believe in our own value, but we're open to the conversation. And that's the spirit of this book. And what I have found, and this is my final, final point, is that just that small shift in, as it were, tone, in attitude, in the way you conduct the conversation, reaps enormous benefits. To some extent, even in China and Russia, of course, in China, there are lots of people who are very interested in free speech. They're just not in the government. But particularly in the swing states, which are going to be decisive for the future of global free speech. If you just make that small shift in the way you talk about these things, reach towards a more universal universalism in a country or like India or Brazil, it really opens up the conversation. And that, I think, is something we should at least think about when we think together about how we promote free speech in a connected world. I look forward very much to free speech from the other panelists. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, there is a tremendous amount of food for thought in, in the book and in, in your brief summary of, uh, of the ideas in it. So it's hard to know what, uh, what to cover, what to respond to, and not only be able to do a little bit. Uh, we were talking out uh, in the hallway before this about what I find myself discussing with people every single day, and that's uh, what you refer to as this surge of anti-liberalism um, manifested in uh, just daily ugly crackdowns on good people from China to Turkey to, uh, to Egypt to um, plenty of other countries that uh, might also, one might put into the category of swing states, which is particularly depressing. Turkey, I think we would have said, was a swing state uh, not so long ago. Um, and my job at the State Department is to try to figure out what to do about all that and how to, um, how to try to understand it. And I think one way I understand it is in the context of the theme of of your book, because I think one reason it is happening is because we are living in a more shared information space than ever before, because that phrase, regardless of frontiers, has taken on much greater practical meaning um, in, in this information age, um, resulting in a situation where our freedom, our enjoyment of freedom, and to say nothing of our promotion of freedom of speech and other freedoms, has become more deeply threatening, more threatening than ever before uh, to uh, authoritarian states, those with authoritarian tendencies who have always been, uh, who never loved freedom of speech, but I think are, are more urgently threatened by the concept and its spread than, uh, than ever before. Um, I think this is partly because of uh, what you uh, refer to in your book as the California effect of, of freedom of speech, and this gets back to the the private superpowers. You know, when you have um, uh, companies in California uh, and other places that are putting all of the information in the world on a single platform that they are trying to make available to all the people in the world, um, or means for people to connect to each other instantly and create uh, not just conversations but communities, organization. Um, th this is, I think, more deeply threatening than we sometimes recognize in our foreign policy making agencies. You know, we, in, in, in the State Department, I, I often remind people that this human rights business, this is not soft power, this is the hardest, this is, this is about the hardest power issues that there are because it is deeply, deeply threatening to the power of people who, uh, in many cases, achieved power by killing and imprisoning others, and um, for whom the game of power uh, really is like the Game of Thrones. It's life or death, and, and they will do what it takes to defend uh, what they have. And, and I think it's also because the, the, the values um, underlying the principle of freedom of speech actually do have a lot of resonance for people uh, all over the world. Now, um, if, if we were talking to a group of young people in China, as I'm sure I think you have many times, and we asked them, do you agree with the Western or the American concept of freedom of speech or of democracy or of human rights? You, you might not even get a majority of people saying yes, because those, those ways of talking about the issue can particularly with all the propaganda they hear, trigger um, very negative reactions. But if you ask the same group of people, uh, if there is a, a company in your city that has spilled a lot of toxic waste um, in your community, should you be able to say something about it? Should the local newspaper be able to expose it and say who's responsible? Um, or a train accident or an earthquake and there are shoddy buildings and people have died. I think there's no question that the vast majority of those young people would say, well, yes, of course. Uh, if you ask them, should you have the same, should you have access to the same knowledge and information as your counterparts in America or Taiwan or Hong Kong, um, should you be able to see the same websites? 
uh, or do you think that older people working for the Communist Party should be able to decide for you what you can see or not see? I, I think framed in that way, most, most of them would say yes, of course. Um, you, you mentioned uh, China winning in Africa. I think I, I disagree with you, at least when it comes to the contest of ideas. Uh, one of the most uh, amazing developments politically in Africa in the last two years, which I'm happy to say we've encouraged in small ways, is the movement for term limits. <coughs> uh, country after country after country, massive demonstration of support, particularly from young people, for the concept that their leaders should not be leaders for life. Um, and in some cases, those movements have succeeded. In others, they have been forcibly put down, as in Burundi right now. We're about to have another contest in the DRC uh, over this concept. And, and a lot of it is that these young people are just connected now and able to talk to each other and organize uh, each other. Um, I don't think you'd have a lot of people in Ugandan villages raising those questions about Google and freedom of speech. They, they want to be on it, they want to use it, they want to be on WhatsApp. And the more they talk to each other, the, the more they, they come up with sort of obvious pragmatic questions to answers to the question, should there be more freedom or not in, in our society? Should our leaders continue to run our countries the way they, they always have? But again, this is profoundly, deeply threatening to uh, authoritarian powers uh, in every part of the world, and it has created a very, very um, concerted, often coordinated pushback uh, from them, which is giving us tremendous trouble. Now, just as our freedom is deeply threatening to them in this uh, global city that you, uh, that you describe, uh, I think the reverse is also true, which is that their restrictions on freedom of speech and other freedoms can become more threatening to us. Um, you know, you, you told the anecdote about the, uh, the innocence of Muslims and demands around the world that we censor that kind of contact, which, you know, we can, we can say no to. Um, but there are more pernicious uh, 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 trends or, or glimmers of trends that I think we do need to be worried about. Um, and this comes back to, to China in particular because it has particular influence. Um, China and, and other countries trying to tell uh, internet companies, for example, to take down content not just for their population but in ways that would deny information to people all over the world. Um, abducting um, people uh, who are in some cases citizens of other countries from Hong Kong from Thailand because they published books that were critical of the Chinese leadership on the theory that if you were born in China, no matter where you may live, no matter what citizenship you may hold, we can come and get you because of your exercise of freedoms that are guaranteed by the countries in which you live. Um, the so-called Great Cannon attack, I don't know if that rings a bell, uh, for you. This was a cyber attack which uh, we believe came from uh, the country I've just been discussing. Um, I won't attribute responsibility more than that. Um, but which was basically aimed at taking down websites in the United States operated by American companies and entities, NGOs and private companies, because they were hosting content that was critical of the the Chinese government. So an offensive attack to um, damage um, private interests in the United States because of their exercise of freedom of expression. And all of these um, attempts are normative challenges because whether it's China or other governments, what they are hoping is that, well, we, 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 we test the limits and if there isn't a response, then the limits shift. And if those limits shift, they shift in ways that affect um, all of us. Um, so uh, again, this, uh, this principle, uh, regardless of frontiers, it works both ways. Um, there are those who are increasingly practicing repression regardless of frontiers, and we need to be concerned about that. Now, as far as our response uh, goes, this is, uh, I guess, my day job and, and where things get uh, interesting and, uh, and complicated. Um, 
a lot of what I do is to uh, go around the world and debate these issues with uh, officials of foreign governments and sometimes public audiences. Um, and uh, often the arguments one hears in defense of restrictions of freedom of speech from governments are quite insincere. It's, it's quite plain that the real motivation is just as just what you think. It's, it's we don't like being criticized and we're going to stop that. Um, sometimes um, one encounters governments that, that claim, no, we do allow freedom of speech. Um, uh, but then they uh, they take action when it crosses a certain line. So a, a good example right now, Vietnam, which I, I like to think shows some glimmers of opening up, something we're trying to encourage. Um, over the last several months, um, Vietnam has been rocked by massive popular protests uh, against um, an environmental disaster uh, caused apparently by a very large industrial company that killed off the fish uh, along much of the coastline of the country, huge cost to livelihoods of, of ordinary people. And um, it, so th this was very grassroots. It was, it was fishermen, it was farmers, it was local people, but then civil society organizations, democracy activists glom onto this and have tried to turn it into a nationwide movement. Um, and just recently, the government um, basically gave in to the main demands of these demonstrators and fined this Chinese company a huge amount and is going to compensate them. So, you know, they would say, we, we allowed this and we, we ultimately responded. But they also arrested the organizers of the protests and particularly focused their ire on um, the the, the, this, what they would call the outside agitators, the um, again those civil society organizations and pro-democracy groups that naturally sought to align themselves with this grassroots popular movement to demand reform. So the message is you can complain, you can speak out when something has been done to harm you, so long as your message is the Vietnamese Communist Party, we recognize your authority, please use it to redress our grievance. But if you cross the line to independent political collective action that calls for changes in the system, then we are going to <coughs> suppress your speech. And, and I've seen that pattern in many, many places. Ethiopia, another good example with the protests in Oromia State in the last several months. Again, the message is you can protest and we respect your right to freedom of speech. But if an opposition political party joins that protest, <coughs> then we will shut it down. Um, but then you get arguments that, um, that actually are, I think, more sincere um, and more searching. Uh, and you touched on, on some of them uh, in, in your talk, Tim. Um, there, there is, of course, the, the question, what do we do about terrorist speech? And I get that uh, all the time. You Americans, you want absolute freedom of speech, but what the hell do we do when people get on our chat rooms? and start praising ISIS and, uh, and Al-Qaeda. Um, and, you know, we, we, we try to say, okay, incitement to violence, that's the line. Um, we can talk about how to define that. And then we push back um, uh, on top of that and say that actually restrictions on speech that are broader than that not only violate our, our, our high principles, but actually undermine our counterterrorism efforts. Because as we've seen again and again, people need to have the outlet for peaceful expression, even if it is very critical of the government, especially if it is critical of the government. Otherwise, they will turn to the violent groups. Um, we have to make that argument every single day, in country after country after country, and it is hard to do, but it's essential. Then there's the argument, particularly in the Middle East, we get this, you know, that you have to understand in our culture there's, there's a culture of irresponsible speech, there's a culture of rumors, and um, you, know, you, you criticize someone and the next day the person who is criticized wants to take up arms, they want, to, they, they want revenge, and you have to, you know. So how, how do you have freedom of speech while maintaining the quality of speech? And, um, the, the truthfulness of speech. Really, do you allow lies?
to go unchallenged in, in, in your democratic um, states. Um, and that's a tough one because, I mean, we, we also worry about the quality of speech and in an age in which we are all kind of in our own information bubbles and, um, you know, you either, you're either hearing from Bernie or you're hearing from Trump, but you're not hearing from the other side and, and we all know where that leads. Um, but then again, we point out that in countries that uh, restrict freedom of speech, the culture of rumors is rarely eliminated. In fact, it's magnified. And um, the Middle Eastern countries where this argument is made are um, a, a very uh, good example uh, of that. All you have left uh, often is the irresponsible speech uh, because the governments in question tend to use their, in practice, their repressive power not against that but against um, political um, dissent. Then there's the argument about financing of speech. Now, in the United States, it takes the form of our debates about campaign financing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in, in most of the, the countries where I have these debates, it's, it's an argument against allowing uh, foreign governments or foreign foundations or NGOs to fund civil society organizations or activists or journalists who are engaging in speech. Um, after all, he who pays the piper pays the tune, so aren't we surrendering our sovereignty if we are a poor country and every NGO that is speaking out critically in our country is funded by the European Union or the United States or the Ford Foundation uh, or supported by Freedom House or, uh, or what have you. And again, there's a certain logic to that argument because we all know from politics that yes, sometimes he who pay, pays the piper does, does uh, select the tune. Um, and then there's the worry that uh, some of this money is not, that's coming in is not coming in from the nice Ford Foundation or the nice European Union. It's coming from um, so-called Islamic charities uh, in uh, the Middle East, and it's actually financing NGOs like Al-Qaeda, um, which one can argue is an NGO, right? And so we have to confront uh, that whole um, set of arguments. So that's interesting. It's a, it's a challenge. I think your book provides um, a, a good guide uh, for, for dealing with a lot of uh, those arguments. Finally, I would say just very strongly agree with um, the, uh, the emphasis that you place, Tim, on uh, the democratic countries and particularly the United States uh, setting a good example. Um, we did have, um, I think, a setback because of the debate around the Snowden revelations, and I think it did hurt us because privacy is an element of freedom of speech in all kinds of ways we can discuss, if you like. Um, and it did hurt us very practically for a while in our efforts to defend principles of internet freedom, um, the so-called multi-stakeholder uh, governance model, i.e. non-governance of, of the internet, um, uh, and all of those uh, all of those good things. I actually think where, where I may depart from you a little bit is I think we've recovered from that mm -hmm. a little bit more than, than perhaps uh, you were suggesting. Um, we, we, many of us thought that we were really going to lose to the Chinese in this debate about, for example, governance of the internet. Mm -hmm. The Brazils and Indias were, were definitely veering towards that, uh, uh, that side, uh, even though their own surveillance policies were far more draconian than anything. Uh, that, that we ever contemplated at the height of the post-9-11 war on terror. Um, but I actually think that the, 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 the record, our record has been quite successful in the last couple of years, and the Indians and the Brazilians have actually been mostly on side in, in ways that perhaps um, were surprising, um, whether that's uh, because of our expert diplomacy or the voices of civil society in their own countries um, probably more the latter than uh, the former, but, but I think um, we're definitely in a better place. Uh, some of the reforms that President Obama uh, announced and implemented after Snowden, I think, have helped a great deal. They've allowed me to go um, and uh, defend these principles with, I think, greater uh, consistency and pride than I otherwise would have been able to. I'm frankly a little bit more worried right now about the EU um, and where it's going. In, in the wake of the recent horrific attacks that have happened in Paris and Brussels um, and elsewhere. Some of the laws that we've seen either considered or adopted 
uh, the French national security laws, for example, um, really, really do um, empower governments to um, monitor uh, speech um, in, in a far more draconian <coughs> fashion than anything that was ever on the books uh, in, in the United States. We, we, we tend to be quite legalistic about these things, even with respect to our intelligence agencies. Um, and I am increasingly hearing the European examples thrown in my face um, when somebody wants to uh, accuse the West of, uh, of hypocrisy. So, I absolutely right point. We all have to be vigilant, um, but perhaps just because of the, 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 the huge strain that Europe is under right now, um, I, I'm a little bit more worried uh, about that. So, with that, I will pass That's the baton. Oh, so much. Well, thank you, and it's a special pleasure to um, to do this with you, uh, to be with Professor Garton Ash. Uh, it's a great book, which I will uh, sort of uh, I'll praise the book with faint damnation at moments. Um, but in general, uh, because it grapples uh, first of all with the perhaps the two most important issues of the day: um, freedom of expression and civility, and the relationship between the two. Um, and I like the fact that he comes to the conclusion that the resolution of the relationship between freedom of expression and civility is not predominantly something that will be solved by law. He has a rather American response. Uh, he gives a great friend of America's uh, con you know, uh, constructive criticism, as he, as he did in the opening of this session. Um, but, it, you know, his is a strong admonition that uh, hate speech laws are not the way um, to deal with the tension between um, freedom of expression and civility. Um, he looks very heavily in this book n at not only the freedom of expression and the amount of expression, but the quality of expression. And that, that's a, an interesting thing and something that um, even Freedom House tries to grapple with when we help journalists around the world were not only trying to help them deal with violence or intimidation or censorship or surveillance, but the quality of how they get people's attention with, with information. Um, you know, and generally speaking, Professor Garton Ash is a, an optimist, and I'll have a, a little bit more to say on that. You know, he's suggesting new rules of the road for the balance between freedom of expression and civility. Um, that aren't grounded in law, they're grounded in civil society. Um, I, I find myself not quite as optimistic as he is that we can, we can get to that um, set of rules of the road, but um, let's talk a bit more about that. I'm reminded of a funny um, uh, encounter we had, and a couple of my colleagues from Freedom House are here and were there for it. We invited the editor-in-chief and the film critic of Charlie Hebdo to speak at, at Freedom House. Um, and in the green room, which is to say my office, uh, I was chatting with the, with the two of them and the head of another organization, a different human rights organization. And the film critic, Jean-Baptiste Thoray, said, you know, one of the most important elements of expression is for it to be violent. And my colleague from the other human rights organization looked horrified because, of course, the narrative of the whole attack on Charlie Debdo's offices is they were subject to violence, the kind of intimidation you criticize so thoroughly in the book. But he said, speech must provoke, it must be violent. And this colleague of mine from the other human rights organization implored him not to exercise his free speech. Please, for an American audience, don't say it that way. They won't understand what you mean. But there is something important about provoking with speech. This book is about a lot of things, and one of my small criticisms is it might be about a few too many things, but it is more than anything, in my eyes, about the relationship between speech and violence. How speech sometimes incites violence, how sometimes free speech has to confront violence, how sometimes free expression averts violence, negotiated uh, outcomes rather than warlike ones. The concept that Professor Gartnash puts forward of the assassin's veto, of not allowing violent intimidation like that uh, that Charlie Hebdo's offices and staff were subjected to, to lead people to appease the violent. 
Um, this is important. He essentially uh, suggests that appeasing violent intimidation of freedom of expression will only beget more violence and intimidation. Interesting point. He is an optimist. Um, in fact, you alluded to John Stuart Mill in your opening remarks. I, it really came to me as I was reading this book um, that there is a kind of optimism like John Stuart Mill, uh, uh, recalling reading him for the first time as an undergraduate, you know, that somehow the marketplace of ideas will triumph if you allow more sunshine um, to be uh, lighting up the truth. There is also an optimism that some of us in the human rights field uh, could use in the way this book looks at the relationship between speech and tyrants. Um, it looks at the way that, of course, tyrants try and block free speech, censor it, manipulate it. It also looks at the ways they use it, whether it is the language of the populist, leftist dictators who speak in the name of the people but then govern in a radically different way, or the trolls who uh, try and pollute the dialogue on social media, um, like the so, the, the so many of them that the Russian government employs. Um, but it is an optimistic view, maybe even a mill-like view that we get from Professor Garton Ash, that in, in the end, freedom of expression will be the undoing of the tyrants. And I think some of us in the human rights field feel like that the bad guys are winning on squeezing civil society and social media and reverse engineering the playbook of the forces of freedom. Um, he reminds us that in the end, um, there will probably be more um, force uh, behind um, the million uh, marketplace of ideas. It's an interesting point he looks at at these twin titans of government and the major uh, corporate entities. It's, it's not a new observation. Uh, Rebecca McKinnon raises it in her um, very interesting book, uh, The Consent of the Networked. Um, but Professor Gardner takes it farther, and especially the idea that governments and those major entities colluding in a sense, or them being perceived, as you said in your opening remarks, as being one of the same is interesting. Look, we think, um, I just want to add an observation that comes from Freedom House's research, particularly its annual report, Freedom of the Press. Um, our Freedom of the Press report looks at the market, uh, the economics of media, not only censorship and laws um, that are pernicious or helpful on, on media freedom. Um, we tend to think that b media, traditional media operations are becoming unworkable and they aren't making money. Um, but there is a, a form of collusion other than the, that of government with the big internet behemoths. Um, and that is in country after country, um, not direct censorship, but cozy relationships with, between the, the media operations and government. That's what we see in Turkey. Um, it's not con necessarily control of the media um, by, uh, you know, the state, but a cozy relationships. And, and that's, a, that's another way in which um, major uh, public and private institutions um, have a pernicious relationship. I guess I'd close by focusing on um, the fifth and sixth of Professor Garton Ash's Ten Commandments. The fifth is that open and civil expression focused on difference is essential. Focus on difference. And the sixth of his commandments, um, respect the believer if not the beliefs held by the believer. This reminds me that much of the discussion about democracy, which Freedom House sees as having been in recession, over the last 10 years in the world, is really about pluralism. There's a, a framing that relates to freedom of expression um, in Professor Garton Ash's book, but in essence, the idea is that all human beings are of value and that they need to explore difference in a respectful way and there needs to be more expression. Now, I want to end with this idea because we have ubiquitous concept of combating violent extremism. Now, I'm not one who will offer a criticism of President Obama for using that expression instead of 
radical Islam because I think it's useful to note that the problem is violent extremism. But one of the problems is that we're focusing on what we're countering. We need to focus on what it is that as a world community or in U.S. foreign policy um, we should be promoting, and that is pluralism. To use a very simple, crude metaphor that one might draw from uh, the titans of the west coast of the United States, we can talk all we want about the hardware of laws and elections, political parties, um, even of well-organized civil society organizations like Freedom House Assists, but the software of democracy is pluralism. Um, and we need to figure out how these rules of the road that Professor Garton Ash suggests we need to um, develop to balance <coughs> a, a expression and civility occur. But it ultimately, if you do not solve the problem of a different ethnic group, a different caste, uh, a different gender, a, a different ideological group, a different religious group being seen as less than human and not having a valid identity, even if you disagree with them thoroughly, we have a problem. And so we need to figure out, is there a way that the United States um, can help promote that in its own clever successors to Radio Free Europe? We look forward to your questions. Okay. Well, please join me in thanking the panel for the presentations. And we have a, a few minutes for a couple of questions. And I think we have microphones or not. Yes, we do. So, sir, you want to start? Thank you so much, uh, Grand Plaster. I was wondering if one of you or any of you could comment on um, concern over maybe um, uh, Peter Thiel going after Gawker uh, for outing him as a, as a gay man. You know, here's uh, a lot of people trying to defend Gawker on the grounds of free speech. Uh, Peter Thiel, self-proclaimed libertarian, now maybe down the road, uh, you know, a free market of ideas leading to maybe needing some tort reform surrounding that. Um, I'm interested in maybe the trajectory of uh, billionaires being able to regulate free speech. Do you want to start with that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, um, we, we've had that problem in England quite a bit, which is, of course, <coughs> Um, London used to be known as a town called Sue, where billionaires would go to uh, destroy their enemies by defamation cases. Um, and so we reformed, as now I describe in the book, a reform of defamation law, which tries to present precisely, precisely that. I mean, I'm, I'm no great fan of Gorka, but I don't think it should be put out of business by one lawsuit. So there's a question of proportionality about the damages and what this reform of defamation law does is to reintroduce an element of proportionality in that. I think the broader point is if there is a problem inside the United States with free speech at the moment it probably is that money speaks too loudly and you can see that in media ownership, you can see that in campaign finance, I have a section about that, or in a case like that, so that I think that is an issue when looking at the United States, is to, to keep the power of money, the speaking power of money, or the silencing power of money, in proper place. If, if I could do a two-finger, because I would just want to agree with that last point. Um, Freedom House, it may now not be well observed, but for 44 years we put out our Freedom in the World report. For the first time in the 44 years, in January, our annual report gave an indicator of a downward trend arrow in the quality of the American democracy. And one of the major reasons, in addition to differential treatment by law enforcement, uh, by race, of, of mm -hmm. people they're dealing with, was money in politics mm -hmm. um, corroding it. Do you think it's worse than it was? I mean, you know, going back to um, you know, the days of Hearst and um, when corruption in Washington was much more simple, you would get a big envelope full of cash in the elevators of the of the Capitol. Um, I always wonder. I mean, it's certainly a problem, but I always wonder about our tendency to think that things have never been as bad as they are today. And and actually, the interesting thing about so many political campaigns, particularly presidential campaigns today, 
is that they tend to be driven more by the small contributions than the large ones. So someone like you know, a Bernie Sanders can outraise Hillary Clinton because of people clicking on $2 donations yes. on the interest. So money was critical to his campaign, right? Money in politics, but it was... Mm. So this is constantly evolving in, in, in different ways that I think some of them are for the worse, but not, not all of them. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. It slightly qualifies the Citizens United point, the fact that we have a lot of small connections. I think there's a different point. I mean, I have a whole chapter about the media you need for um, really effective free speech for good government, which is the classic American argument for free speech. It's actually the biggest single American argument for free speech. And it struck me just, I arrived last night turning on CNN, this absolutely bipolar narrative that you get hour upon hour upon hour on CNN or on almost any American TV channel in which the closed circle of the campaigns and the media, the media and their campaigns, each feeding on the other. This is exactly what happened in the British referendum campaign. Yep. And it is not, the people are not ultimately well served by that closed circuit between oh, the media and campaign. I completely agree with that and, 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 not, and the closed circuit but also the closed spaces that people then in, inhabit. You know, in, when I was a child uh, in the United States, most people got their information from three television network news programs Absolutely. that were on at 7 p.m. every night and they were relatively objective and then we all went off and argued and we were for Nixon or McGovern or whatever but the 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 underlying the, you know we, we were arguing from a common set of facts for the most part and and I think we can I don't know if we can ever go back to that I don't know if there's an innovation in this information space that can at least get us back somewhat to to that state of uh, affairs, or at the very least can train kids, and maybe this is a challenge for our education system, Absolutely. to be able to discern truth from falsehood, rumor from fact, um, more responsibly uh, with all of the information that they're barraged with from so many different sources. That, that's, that's what I worry about more than anything else. Question right there. Hi, uh, Jody Herman with the National Endowment. Grab it. Hi, Jody Herman with the National Endowment for Democracy. So, maybe about a week or two ago, when I was driving home, I was listening to uh, NPR, and it was a conversation about our, our current election cycle. And I, I feel badly because I can't actually remember who was being interviewed at the time, but I, I heard him say this phrase, and I literally turned off the radio, and I drove home, and I kept repeating it in my head until I pulled into my driveway, and I pulled out my phone and wrote it down in a message to myself. And what he said was, democracy depends on passion being diluted by reason. Now, I think you could substitute the word passion for the word civility, or for Mark's word of, of, of pluralism, and, and it would apply equally to our current political debate as it does to our conversation today about, uh, about freedom um, of expression. And my, my question to all of you is, is the how question, right? So I agree with what you have to say. Uh, the question I have for you is, you know, who bears the responsibility here? Is it a mission of, of the state, of civil society? Is it a function of our schools? teaching things like digital literacy, which is a class, for example, my, my middle school child takes is on digital literacy, which is about understanding resources and how things are sourced and that you can't, you know, you can't cite Wikipedia in your, you know, in your book report as, you know, as a, as a legitimate source. But who bears the responsibility at the end of the day for doing this and, and how do we get there and how long is it going to, how long is it going to take? Mark or? Well, I, I the way I'd, I'd answer the question backwards, which is there, there's a, a, probably an assumption that it doesn't lie in the hands of political leaders only. Um, but I do think that, particularly in democracies, um, political leaders have to show some, some strength. And so when there are populist ideas that arise, um, they have to be opinion leaders as opposed to populism followers or stokers. Um, and I think you also see in a number of places that have come up in the conversation before in major nations of the global south where 
wrong-headed ideas are are stoked or accepted by by leaders, whether it's about the United States or about um, you know uh, you know Holocaust denial or whatever it may be, that they 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 should they need to stand up and and not. Um, you know, stoke that populism. But that's that's not the solution. I just think we cannot take politicians of the global north and global south democracies off the hook. No, I agree with that. I mean, I'd just add two things. One is, um, I do think there's a lot to be said for good public service broadcasting. I mean, if, 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 a, if a robust civility is to some extent preserved <coughs> in Britain, it's because we have the BBC. And you have a pluralism of views represented in one medium. And I do frankly think, I think the loss of the fairness doctrine in American broadcasting was a real loss. Because it's true that you have what, what in the jargon is called external pluralism. Right? If you switch between Fox, MSNBC, and CNN, you get the range of views. But that leaves a hell of a lot of people in their own boxes, having their own prejudices reinforced. And this is, you know, it's really interesting. I, I cite in the book a study of hate speech leading to violence in Kenya. There is far, far more of it on Facebook than on Twitter. Why? Because Twitter is a public platform where you're immediately challenged by people who think differently. Facebook, by definition, you're with your friends and you can say these mm -hmm. absolutely outrageous things and you're not challenged. That's point number one. Point number two, I, I do think that we have to go back to school. I mean, to what people are taught at schools and educate people to live in this connected world. There are some uh, British primary schools that have a technique which they call constructive controversy, which deliberately takes pupils, what's your point of view on this? Now argue the opposite case. Swap sides, argue the opposite case. I've seen this in action. It has a fantastic impact on people and it teaches people to live in a diverse society with diverse views and you know to cope with it. And so I think there's you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to be done starting at school. Mm -hmm. You want to say anything, though? Okay. Yeah, one point on that, we've done some events here to commemorate the 50th anniversary of uh, the beginning of Firing Line. And what I'm struck by is when our interns and our young, younger people see clips from the Firing Line interviews that Buckley conducted, uh, even some of the um, footage of when he did um, roundtables with all the presidential candidates in different election cycles when he was on the air, only mainly in the 80s, they were all shocked at how civil and how likable they were to each other. They weren't yelling at each other, they weren't criticizing each other's anatomical parts and so on. And, <laughs> and, 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 and it's, they didn't that. think that could happen. They, they had never really seen it yeah. done in that way in such an intelligent fashion. And it, it is a lost art in some ways. But it's very interesting that you see, Mark, because, Mike, Mike, because mm -hmm. we, we have the opposite problem. And, I, and actually, one of the most interesting things Tom said, amongst the many interesting things he said, was about Europe being held up as a negative example in other places, you, know, mm -hmm. you did in Europe. Because we have the opposite problem, which is we have this culture of trying to protect children <coughs> from anything that might unsettle them or make mm -hmm. them feel threatened or offended mm -hmm. and so on. And you protect them all the way along. And mm -hmm. in the end, they become incapable of living with difference and actually you know, working through a conflict, and this leads you to safe spaces in yeah. universities and the absurd yeah. idea that I'm threatened because there's a statue of Cecil Rhodes on the second floor of a building, mm -hmm. which is right. absurd. Right. Well, we've gone beyond our time. Let me do, if we can do one quick question with quick answers, then we can turn to the reception, and Timothy's going to sign books of the, anyone who would like that, and if you guys say that would be wonderful. I know you have real lives too, so. Uh, how about the gentleman back there? Uh, yes, uh, I'm, uh, yes, thank you. Please make a quick question. Yes, uh, I'm Stephen Yelverton, and uh, I have a question uh, for Professor uh, Garden Ash. What is the extent of the anti blasphemy laws in Britain now, and do they only protect the Church of England or all religions equally? So, we abolished the blasphemy law a few years ago which only protected Christianity and insight introduced a new offense called incitement to religious hatred and this was partly done by the Blair government to try and woo back Muslim voters 
who had been so alienated by the Iraq war. <laughs> Apropos, in our minds, certainly in Britain in these days. Um, fortunately, we, I mean those of us who are, uh, want to defend free speech, got entered into this law, what is called the English Pen Clause, which is such a magnificently grandiose exclusion of all kinds of criticism, ridicule, and insult of any religion which must be allowed, that almost nobody has ever been prosecuted under this law. So mm. in that thing, I think it's quite a satisfactory law, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so on that note, would you please join me in thanking our panel again? And Timothy Garton Ash. <laughs>